I bring greetings to you in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And today I want to continue our series, our Bible study series, Chosen Chapter 2, covering contemporary issue. So this Bible study series, we study a chapter, then branch off to do uh, biblical ethics. So today we, the chosen chapter is Romans 13. And the topic of biblical ethics is war. Can Christians be involved in war? Can Christians actually be soldiers fighting uh, battles in in any country? Uh, be part of the army, be part of the uh, uh, navy, or any kind of activity that involves killing of people. That's the question that we're going to answer. Especially, we have to ask these questions because uh, Ukraine and Russia has been have been in war for quite some time, and now uh, the Hamas uh, attacked Israel on October seventh. Uh, October seventh became the September eleventh for Israel. So many people killed, a thousand five hundred people killed. And today, as I speak to you on 29th of October, 2023, uh, what I'm reading is that uh, Israel has begun his its land war against the Hamas. So far, it was hitting or, or via the air. So Israel is now retaliating via, uh, via the land. And this looks like a long protracted war. So let's go to God's word. Let's read Romans chapter 13. And uh, there are different ways in which you can study Romans 13. The first uh, seven verses, first seven verses, Romans 13, 1 to 7, is talking about a Christian's relationship with the government or uh, it's talking about Christian, the Christian and politics, uh, Christian relationships, a Christian's relationship with a local government. Uh, you, or you can, the Christian relationship with the king or the sovereign, the, the human sovereign of the land. So you can title it in various ways. So let's see what is the main thing in that first section. Uh, this section says, let me read, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. A Christian should not have a belligerent attitude. A uh, Christian should submit to government authorities, except, of course, if the government authorities ask the Christian to do something against the written word of God. In that case, um, there can be uh, disobedience as we see in the book of Acts, the early part of the book of Acts. We see that uh, the apostles uh, continue to preach about Jesus, even though there's a government ban on that. And then in the Old Testament, Daniel and his uh, Daniel's friends uh, do not obey the king when the king asks them to, again, do idol worship. So that's an Old Testament example, a New Testament example. Except in during these kind of cases, a Christian is a, supposed to submit himself to the governing authorities, Romans 13, 1. But there's no authority except that which the God has established, which means you can uh, vote in an election, but the outcome of the vote is decided by God. So it's not really the vote that brings somebody to power, but God who brings someone to power. So voting is important, but remember that it is God who has brought the politician to power. Uh, then it says in verse 2, if you rebel against authority, you rebel against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Uh, you know, those are serious words. Uh, and then third verse is very important, Romans 33. 
for rulers do not hold terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Rulers do not hold terror for those who do right, but they do hold terror for those who do wrong. And this is a strong call for governments across the world to punish evil, punish the child rapists, punish uh, those who kill babies in the womb, abortion, and so on and so forth. Do you want to be free from the fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and he will commend you. So here's a call for Christians to obey traffic rules, to, to, uh, to do things the government asks us to do ex in all matters except in matters where the government will contradict the written word of God. Uh, it goes on and on. I'm, uh, I won't uh, spend too much time on this section. Uh, verse 5, it's necessary to submit to the authorities not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. Uh, so there are two reasons given why we must obey the government. One is uh, fear of punishment. Uh, so fear of punishment, I want to um, remark here, is also mentioned in the Bible as a motivation for obedience, as a motivation for holiness. It's mentioned in 2 Peter chapter 3, 10 and 11. If you read 2 Peter chapter 3, the coming of the Lord, the day of judgment, the destruction of the earth, all that is seen as a call for holiness in 2 Peter chapter, chapter 3. Here, uh, punishment by the king, punishment by the government of the land is also given as a valid motivation for us to obey the com command of God, uh, command of the government, uh, where they don't contradict the written word of God. But, and then uh, there's a second reason, Romans 13, 5, not only because of possible punishment, but because of conscience. So our conscience must tell us, our conscience hopefully is telling us to respect the government, to obey the government, to submit to the government. Uh, as far as the government doesn't uh, contradict the written word of God, you know, if you want, we can just quickly read that scripture uh, where the Bible says that the early church believers uh, were very clear about this. Uh, and that is, uh, look at Acts chapter 4. And uh, we see that uh, Peter and John stand before the Sanhedrin uh, and uh, they answer questions. Uh, and then in verse 20, uh, verse 19 and 20, Acts 4, 19 and 20, but Peter and John replied, Judge for yourself whether it is right in God's eyesight to obey you rather than God, for we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Uh, so they say this in response, uh, verse 18, Acts 4, 18. They called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. So Acts 8, 4, 18, they are told not to speak about Jesus. But verse 19, Peter and John replied that they would obey God rather than obey men or obey the government. So that's one example. It's except that, you know, generally we need to obey the government. We need to uh, obey the uh, local government. So that's about Christian and his relation, his uh, the political life of a Christian. And then from verse uh it moves on, this chapter moves on, verse 8 to 10, talks about the Christian and the Mosaic law, or, or if the first seven verses of Romans 13 is about the political life of the Christian, the next two verses, eight, three verses, Romans 8, 
13, 8 through 10 is talking about the social life of a Christian or the relationship that a Christian has with men, especially uh, people around him, uh, the social life. So it says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow men has fulfilled the law. So this section is also giving a clue to the government as to what rules that they must emphasize. That is the rules. This is the rule that, you, that the government should ensure that the people love one another. And when they love one another, they fulfill God's law. The law, Romans 38, the law talking about the law of Moses, the law of God. And then verse 9, the commands, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. And whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one rule, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does, not, does no harm to its neighbor, therefore love is a fulfillment of the law. Okay. Uh, before I stay here, I just want to go back to verse 6 and 7. Uh, talk about uh, the Christian paying taxes. So that's something we must do. And as a ministry, uh, uh, we submit accounts to the government of India after an audit uh, every year, ever since we started uh, existing in 2006, registered in 2007. Even we did that this year uh, out of respect, out of obedience for Romans 13, 6, and 7. And also as individuals, both Ivan and myself submit taxes. So that's our relationship with the government, relationship uh, that's our talking about the, our political life. Uh, now, talking about the social life, Romans 8, uh, 13, 8 onwards, uh, it's basically talking about how a Christian should love the people around him. And then that love is expressed by not committing adultery, not murdering, not stealing, not coveting. Uh, so these are the these are the moral laws of the Ten Commandments that a Christian is still bound by. Uh, if you read Hebrews 13, 4, uh, again, uh, the Bible talks about this. Let the marriage bed be kept pure, which means uh, it's basically repeating the Ten Commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not covet your neighbor's wife and so on and so forth. Do not steal. Do not murder. Do not covet. Uh, so the moral laws of the Old Testament, we are still under it. So we need to spend a lot of time reading the Old Testament and the moral laws of the Old Testament, we still need to follow. Not the ceremonial laws, because Jesus has uh, fulfilled all that by his work on the cross. Uh, but the moral laws. Uh, because in the book of Hebrews, the chapter 8, verse, the last verse, I think verse 13, it says, the ceremonial laws, talking about laws, mean, in the context reveals it's the ceremonial laws are all made obsolete because of his once for all work on the cross. Uh, so that's uh, about the Christian's relationship with people uh, where the Christian must love his fellow men and the Christian must have a holy relationship with fellow men where there's no adultery, where there's no murder, where there's no stealing, where there's no coveting. So the, when that's that's love. Love is not mushy words. Love is not saying I love you, I love you, and um, it, it could involve that. But love, predominantly, love in the Christian vocabulary is actually holiness in relationship where there's no adultery, where there's no murder, there's no stealing, no coveting. Again, now the question is. What about murder in the, in the time of war? We will come to that in just a bit. We will come to that in just a bit. Okay. Uh, and then the final section. The final section is uh, if the first section of Romans 13 talks about the, talked about the political life, second section talked about the social life, the third section talks about the personal life. Uh, we could say that. 
Um, specifically, it's talking about what's going on in our soul, our personal life. Verse 11, Romans 13, 11 says, and I and do understand this, understand the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from slumber because your salvation is nearer than when we first believed. So Paul is talking about salvation future. He's talking about the second coming of Jesus. We have said this before in many of our Bible studies. We are saved past when we repent and we put our faith in Jesus. It's like it happened with a dying thief on the cross. Jesus promised him paradise, which means uh, he said, today you will be with me in paradise. So at that instant, when the dying thief put his faith on Jesus, he was saved from the punishment of sin. And then we are being saved uh, from the power of sin. Uh, Romans chapter 7 talks about how Paul said uh, the thing that he didn't want to do, he exactly ended up doing. And who will save me from this body of from this wretched, from that wretched life, from that wretched life of uh, falling back into sin. And he says at the end of that chapter, through Jesus Christ, and then eighth chapter, he talks about the work of the Holy Spirit, how to the work of the Holy Spirit, Romans 8, 13 especially, he could put to death the misdeeds of the body. So every day as we cooperate with the Holy Spirit, we overcome the power of sin. First one was presence of sin. Second one was his power of sin. And now he's talking about uh, salvation future where we will be free from the very presence of sin. Revelation 21 talks about it a little more where we, will, we are going to a place after the second coming and that place there is no sin at all. So that so our salvation is nearer than when we first believed, Romans 13, 11. We must understand that the Bible talks, keeps talking about these three kinds of salvation. We would be, we should be, we would be blind if we don't observe that. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here. These are all analogies. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Again, more analogies. Let's behave decently as in daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness. Not in sexual immorality and debauchery. Not in dissension and jealousy. So these are different categories of sin. Orgies and drunkenness. Alcohol problem. Not in sexual immorality and debauchery. Adultery. Adultery temptation. Alcohol temptation. Not in dissension and jealousy. Uh, this is uh, connecting, this is talking about interpersonal relationship temptation. Arrows in, in, in interpersonal relationship. Uh, basically, it's trying to cover different kinds of sin that typically uh, attacks a, a Christ follower. Uh, orgy, orgies and drunkenness, uh, sexual immorality and debauchery, dissension and jealousy. So we, he says, Paul says, including himself in the command, Paul is not beyond sexual immorality temptation. Paul is not beyond drunkenness temptation. Paul is not beyond dissension temptation. Paul is not beyond jealousy. These temptations come to Paul. That's why he says, let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality, not in debauchery, not in dissension, not in jealousy. So that's Romans 13, 13. Rather, clothe ourselves with the Lord Jesus and do not think of how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. So verse Romans 13, 13 talks about the way of overcoming sexual temptation. What is the way clothing the Lord Jesus Christ? So verse Romans 13, 14, sorry. Romans 13, 13 says, not in sexual immorality, or talking about the way of overcoming sexual immorality. And how do we do that? Clothing ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And do not think of how to gratify the 
desires of the sinful nature. Uh, that's very important. Uh, so this verse is, this phrase, do not think of how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature has been used by various Bible teachers to remind us that we should not feed our flesh with entertainment that displeases God, entertainment that has explicit depictions of sex, for example. Why is that wrong? Because in those kind of depictions, nakedness is seen. And then in Leviticus 18, uh, we understand a woman's nakedness belongs to the eyes of the husband alone. And so when these depictions are there in the web series, and if we continue to watch them, then we displease God. We are feeding the flesh. We are thinking of how to gratify the desires of sinful nature and acting upon that thought. So we should not think of how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature and not act on that thought. Rather, we must clothe ourselves with the Lord Jesus. Intimacy with Jesus is the only way to be holy. The only way to win over porn, the only way to be sexually pure, not just sexually pure, only way to overcome alcoholism. And if you are addicted to alcohol, if you're going back to drinking again and again, here is good news. Clothe yourself in Jesus and you can overcome alcohol addiction. And the, 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 the only thing that can bring us out of jealousy and dissension is again clothing ourselves with the Lord Jesus. So Romans 13, 11 to 14 talks about our personal holiness. Uh, Romans chapter 13, 1 to 7 talks about our political holiness. And Romans 13, 8 to 10 talks about our social holiness, political holiness, social holiness and personal holiness. So that's a little bit of a summary of Romans 13 uh, in this chosen chapter 2, covering contemporary issue. But again, now, what about this whole thing of war? So can a Christian be part of a war? Uh, and that's something we must answer. Uh, there are three views on this as Norman Geisler, uh, a Bible scholar, has explained. The first view is uh, that uh, uh, the first view is activism, which says it is always a right to participate in war. The second view is pacifism pacifism, which says it's never right to participate in war, but I believe the biblical way is selectivism, which means some wars are just and Christians can take part in those wars. And what is the biblical basis for that? Exodus chapter 22 and verse 2, it says if a thief is caught breaking in and is, and is stuck struck so that he dies. The defender is not guilty of bloodshed. So you're in your house and somebody breaks in and and you use an object and you strike the thief and the thief dies. The Bible says, according to Exodus chapter 22 and verse 2, uh, you're not guilty of bloodshed. And this will also come against uh, crimes that you commit during in self-defense and that's not a crime at all. So Exodus chapter 22 and verse 2 uh, tells us that, you know, there are instances where killing can be morally justified as in this case. Uh, and then Genesis 9, 6 says, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made man or God made humankind. So if you shed the blood of man, by man, your blood will be shed or you will be killed. 
So the Old Testament is very clear. So there are eight times when life has to be taken, especially if there is a stubborn murderer, then his life has to be taken here and now. Yes, there's going to be a day of judgment where God will send that person to hell if that person doesn't repent. But here and now, through the government, as we already read in Romans 13, God can prepone the day of judgment and execute judgment. That's one of the main duties of the government, to execute judge, judgment, to punish unjust people, punish murderers, stubborn murderers. And that's something we must understand. And the Bible says that uh, in Genesis 14, if you read Genesis 14, there are divinely approved wars. There are divinely approved wars such as the one that Abraham fought against the kings of the valley of Siddim. And Geisler says when they took aggressive action and carried off Abraham's nephew Lot and his possession, that is Genesis 14, 12, Abraham attacked them and routed them. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions. That is Genesis 14, 15, 16, 14th chapter 15 and 16. And after this act of war, hear me good. After this act of war, Abraham was blessed by Melchizedek who said, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, the creator of heaven and the earth. Blessed be God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hands. Verses 19 and 20. So Melchizedek, who is a picture of Jesus Christ in the New Testament book of Hebrews, we understand that, blesses Abraham. Verses 19 and 20 of Genesis chapter 14. After this act of war. So, uh, Geisler says, Norman Geisler says, thus Abraham's military activity in defense of the innocent was clearly blessed by the Lord. So if an innocent country is hit and as a country you go and support of the innocent country, you know, that action is justified. So selectivism, certain acts of war can be justified. So that's something we, we must uh, acknowledge. Uh, and then we must, we must understand that uh, uh, even the New Testament underlines this because in Romans 13, 4, as we just read, but if you do wrong, be afraid for the one in authority does not bear the sword in vain. So the New Testament Geisler says, affirms that sword is still, the sword is still a divinely appointed means of human justice. Sword, you know, it could mean various things in various countries. Sword could mean electric chair in some countries. Uh, sword could mean death by hanging in some countries. Um, it is still a valid, divinely appointed means of human justice, according to Romans 13 and verse 4. Uh, and then John the Baptist. Uh, we read about John the Baptist, how he interacted with the people uh, who were soldiers. And in Luke chapter 3, verse 14, uh, if we carefully read, Luke chapter 3, verse 14, John was telling them how to be good soldiers. John was not telling them, look here, guys, you are in the wrong pro prof uh, profession. Leave the profession of, uh, of being in the army, of, uh, of being a soldier. So jo John, John speaks to them about being a good soldier, a godly soldier. Okay, Luke 3, 14, John never says, being a soldier itself is wrong, so come out of the army. He doesn't say that. So that's something we must understand. Uh, we could go on and on, but uh, uh, I am not going to do that. Uh, but there's another crucial verse that we must understand to understand selectivism or, you know, selecting uh, understanding there are select times in which war is justified 
is the biblical response to the question is can a Christian be part of a war? Uh, in Acts chapter 25 and verse 11, uh, Paul said in Caesar's court, if I'm guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. Paul said in Caesar's court, if I'm guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die, which means Paul himself recognized that he could be executed if he had committed a crime. So he was okay with it. But he was trying to say that he didn't commit a, a crime that needed, that 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 uh, qualified him or that had to push him to death. But rather, uh, he had to now live and he had to be released. But he says, if I'm if I was guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not deserve to die. So again, it's a big green tick on selectivism, which means there are times in which people can be killed, and what you do will not be a sin against God. Uh, so uh, that's from Acts twenty five and verse eleven. Uh, so. Uh, so this is just about it. So the, the, the Bible references are from Genesis 14, Exodus 22, verse 2, Genesis 9, 6, um, Luke 3, 14, Romans 13, 4. And that's why we studied the full chapter of Romans in chosen chapter 2 covering contemporary issue. Um, and also... Uh, if you read chapters like uh, Exodus 19 and Joshua 10, uh, because God was acting via Israel, that is when uh, God sanctioned killing of people through the armies of Israel in Exodus 19 and Joshua chapter 10, uh, where the wicked residents of Canaan were wiped out in Joshua chapter 10. Uh, and we also see that uh, uh, different uh, how as, as Israel fought the battle in obedience to God, God did miraculous things like uh, holding the sun in its, in its place or basically extending the daylight for the battle to be completed for victory to be won supernatural things happen why because that was a divinely sanctioned war we see that how god extended the daylight for the war to be completed so again it's a proof that god there are wars in which uh god did give a sanction god did give an approval uh, as we see in the book of joshua as we see in the book of exodus and uh, so on and so forth. So, uh, so that's my brief response uh, for the question, can Christians be part of a war or can Christians be involved in killing uh, as soldiers? All right. Uh, so uh, I, I hope this uh, Bible study answered uh, your question concerning war. Uh, but also, I need to also quickly answer the question. Uh, so is the Bible, does the Bible support, currently support national Israel? And so should we get hyper about Israel now having started its land war against the Hamas? Should we be cheering for Israel and not cheering for Hamas? I think, uh, we need to do our careful reading about to see on which side the justice is. Um, and here we do see that Hamas came and attacked Israel unprovoked on the 7th of October and Israel is retaliating. So what Israel is doing um, is right. Um, but uh, we cannot come to the conclusion that everything Israel does is right. Uh, nor can we say that uh, everything that uh, a country does in a war 
is right. You know, there could be a mixture of right and wrong. So we need to understand that. And so people have uh, people have tried to say that uh, let based on Amos chapter nine and uh, the last verse. Let me read that to you. So based on this, that Israel will never lose, national Israel will never lose a war. Uh, I will plant Israel in their own land. Never again will they be uprooted from the land I gave them. Amos 9.19, 9.15, Amos 9.15. So based on Amos 9.15, I will plant Israel in their own land and never again will they be uprooted from the land I gave them. So based on Amos 9.15, are we saying that Israel will never be uprooted so Hamas can never win them. And then there's a time that so many different countries came. Israel miraculously won over them. So we know the story. So is it saying that this is passage saying Amos 9.15, is it saying that Israel will never lose a, a war? I am not so sure because um, I believe there's one interpretation which makes sense. And that is God has now uh, chosen the church as the new Israel, because Israel rejected the Messiah. And uh, uh, the reference for that is Matthew 21, 43. Matthew 21, 43. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, you meaning Israel, and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Uh, a people who will produce its fruit. It's talking about the church, which includes Gentiles, which includes people like you and me. So God's focus is no longer on national Israel, but is on new Israel. And uh, so another thing we I need to mention is Romans 4.13, Romans chapter 4, verse 13, where the Bible says... Uh, Romans 4.13, it's not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes through faith. Romans 4.13 tells us that our promised land, that the new Israel, that is you and I, part of the ch church, so we have a promise that we will, we are as of the world, not just one small tract of land in Israel, but the world, literally the world. How does that come? Through faith in Jesus Christ. When uh, And when we have that faith, he gives us righteousness, but he also gives makes us the heir of the whole world. And we know that will happen. We become the heirs of the whole world when Jesus returns the second time. Revelation 19, riding a white horse, and then con he conquers. Jesus politically or literally conquers every land that are still under the dominion of Satan. So we wait for that time for us to occupy the promised land. And in that promised land, when we occupy, nobody can uproot it. That's what the last verse of Book of Amos talks about. It's not talking about what's going to happen to current Israel. I do not think so. So that's my clarification. So I wanted you to close your eyes and especially read Romans 1, uh, Romans the full chapter, how uh, the, this chapter is calling us for uh, political purity. If you're not paid your taxes, pay taxes. Uh, if you don't follow traffic rules, follow traffic rules, obey the government. Uh, when government doesn't contradict the written word of God. And then social... Uh, uh, holiness. It says, except the only debt that should be outstanding is the debt of love. So let's love people. And uh, so this passage is calling us to love people like never before. Uh, the, the next passage, uh, Romans 13. And then the last section of Romans 13 is talking about personal purity. The only way to be sexually pure is by clothing ourselves with Jesus, intimacy with Jesus. And let's never forget that. That is the way to overcome temptation. Lord, we thank you for speaking to us. And I pray that for every anyone who's been hearing this message and following this message, I pray that you'll 
as they commit their life to you, as they get intimate with you, you who died for them on the cross, you cleansed, uh, you who can cleanse them with your precious blood, you who rose again for the dead, you who got, who's going to come back. Lord, I pray that they will be people will be clothed in Jesus and overcome a Lord alcohol addiction, Lord adultery addiction, and so on and so forth. That they will live a holy life. We pray for the different wars going on. Let there be peace because you are the Prince of Peace. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us today. We ask all this with thanksgiving in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. Thank you for tuning in and for further details about our ministry, uh, grabbing the Google generation from Gehenna Mission, G4 Mission, please WhatsApp uh, 91-888-6040-605, 91-888-6040-605, and we'll be happy to talk to you or about what you do for your local church. Uh, if you're stirred to support this ministry, this is an Indian ministry to the Google generation, um, we are into evangelism, we are into Bible teaching, we are not a local church, uh, please uh, reach out to us again via the same number via WhatsApp, or you could email as well as, as well, email duke at gmail.com, email is part of the ID, email duke, nine letters at gmail.com. God bless you, and you have a blessed Sunday.